welcome everyone to the Remark Institute uh, at New York University. Uh, I'm its director, Stefano Diorlanos, and it's a great pleasure today uh, to, uh, to, to welcome uh, Rory Stewart, uh, author of As You Already Know, How Not to Be a Politician, which is the uh, book that he'll be presenting today. Um, I'm going to give very brief introductions to our speakers and preparing for the uh, event, and so far as you already uh, surely you're here because you know who he is. Uh, nevertheless, Rory Stewart is, of course, uh, the um, co-host of The Rest is Politics with Alastair Campbell and the president of the nonprofit Hip Directly. Uh, he was a member of the British Parliament for about a decade uh, until the dramatic events uh, discussed in uh, this book. Uh, and he was a minister for four ministries uh, and eventually a candidate for the leadership of uh, the Conservative Party. Uh, earlier, as you will know from his earlier writings, and as he also discusses early on in this book, he was deputy governor of Mason in Iraq. Uh, he has been a professor at Harvard University and the director of its Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, a visiting fellow at Yale. Uh, and perhaps the way that most of us got introduced to Rory, uh, the places in between, the author of the places in between. Um, this time, uh, we get a book that's in some respects quite similar, in one respect very different, namely that it comes with a, the most Machiavellian title the, of any book published this year, um, which as you read on turns out to be quite a nice feint, but it's not exactly the, <laughs> the, 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 the structure or purpose of the, the book. So um, Rory is, is, is going to say a few uh, remarks at the beginning, and then we're going to move into uh, a discussion first uh, between him and Natasha Lewis, editor of Descent Magazine, a major magazine for uh, the intellectual left here in New York. Uh, she has been an editor of Descent since 2020, and she has also written for New Humanist, New Republic, ProPublica, Guernica, and elsewhere. And then afterward also with Susan Peterson, the Gouverneur Morris Professor of History, um, whom you'll know as a feminist historian before there were many uh, as an author for the LRB and for uh, her many books uh, that range between work on Eleanor Rathbone, uh, the League of Nations and the British Empire, uh, now the uh, Balfour family, which is forthcoming, and uh, actually the book that I first uh, read of Susan's on the uh, early welfare state uh, in Europe. And so with this, uh, Rory, the, the stage is yours. And, um, welcome to our mark. Well, thank, thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, I mean, I'm very much hoping this will be more of a conversation, and obviously I have two very distinguished um, people on the panel with me, but uh, they very kindly allowed me to start with a few remarks. So I'm, I'm going to try to take things out into a bigger context, a bigger frame, and then come back into the book. And I want to try to situate this book in the context of three historical ages. The first from 1989 to 2004, that I want to call basically the age of the liberal global order. The second from 2004 to 2014, which I want to call the age of uncertainty, and the age of 2014 till February of last year, which I want to call the age of populism. And I'm going to sketch out these uh, different, please, please come in. Uh, these different ages, and, and then explain really what the theme of this book is. And the theme of the book basically is of a man who comes in formed by that first age, uh, enters parliament in the second age, and continues in parliament through into the third age, um, but struggles to make that historical transition. So let me go through my third, three ages. So first age, uh, 89 to 2004. This, of course, is an age which feels to somebody like me like an age of extraordinary liberal optimism. I joined the British Army in 1991 uh, at the moment at which we were just dusting down and getting rid of all our Russian tank spotting journals because the Berlin Wall had just come down. We were entering a period in which it felt as though a new economic model had been discovered, which was going to guarantee prosperity to the world. It was going to be based on some sort of combination of deregulation, free markets, and globalization. It was an economic model that seemed immensely successful in the United Kingdom. That period from the late 80s through the 90s 
GDP per capita in the United Kingdom for the first time since 1870 surpassed that of the United States. We began to close the gap on the United States. Our productivity was the uh, second highest in the OECD. It was an age in which it felt as though this formula for prosperity would spread democracy around the world. The number of democracies in the world measured by the Freedom House Index between 1988 and 2004 doubled, so doubling the number of democracies, not just famously in Central and Eastern Europe, but of course in Latin America, uh, in Southeast Asia. And I found myself as a young diplomat uh, in the embassy in Indonesia, out there with the students on the streets in 1998, demonstrating to bring down General Suharto, who had ruled Indonesia for 32 years and to usher in a new democratic era. And it was an age in which the notion that we had an economic formula and that this economic formula was leading to the spread of democracy around the world coincided with the concept of a liberal global order. And again, in my own particular life, I was deployed to Bosnia and to Kosovo, the archetypal humanitarian interventions of the 1990s, where suddenly it seemed possible for the United States and its allies to intervene in wars. And in the case of Bosnia, situation where before the intervention, 37,000 people had been killed in Sarajevo by Serbian artillery in the siege, in which there had been 120,000 people under arms, in which there were 150 checkpoints on the roads leading up from Sarajevo up to the Serbian border. War criminals were on the loose. And an intervention led by the United States occurred, but under the auspices of the UN, and then eventually under the auspices of the European Union, we get to a situation in which there are more injuries to American soldiers on the basketball courts than there are outside the bases. There's no insurgency. And by 2000, the number of armed men has been reduced from 120,000 down to 6,000. All the checkpoints have disappeared. All the war criminals have now been arrested and put on trial in The Hague, and the crime rate in Bosnia was lower than Sweden. So everything feeling pretty good. And at home, for many of these reasons, we still seem to feel we had a pretty legitimate system, that the whole world was headed, if not quite in our direction, at least in the direction of some putative Sweden, and that there was no real ideological conflict anymore. This was the age of Blair, of Clinton, of the Third Way, Schroeder in Germany. If you look at polling data from the period, it all looks like a bell jar, all the votes from the center ground, where my fingers are. There are no votes where my elbows are at the extremes. So this was not just the period that formed uh, me. It was the period uh, which formed a whole generation of European and potentially American politicians. So, for example, in, in the United Kingdom, this was the exact period where David Cameron, Ed Miliband, Ed Balls uh, left Oxford University, went straight into their political parties, began to develop their view of the world. Uh, so much so that as late as 2010 and even the 2015 general election, they are still presenting themselves proudly as the heirs to Blair. You know, this paradigm, the Tony Blair paradigm, remains absolutely central to what is supposed to be the center ground of politics. And then things begin to change, and they begin to change pretty rapidly. But the joke of the book is that those of us actually involved in the work don't notice that the world is changing, right? <laughs> we continue to operate, broadly speaking, as though things remain unchanged. They change first with the financial crisis in 2008, which of course explodes the first notion that we've sorted out all the economics. Instead, we become slowly, too slowly and painfully aware that these economic policies, this globalization has coincided with stagnant incomes, with rising inequality between countries, between regions, between individuals within our country. This is the period also where some of the notions of democratization begin to get a little bit more fragile. The number of democracies ceases to increase. China becomes larger than the British economy in 2005, larger than the German economy in 2006, larger than the Japanese economy in 2007. And contrary to many of the assumptions that had existed in 1989, it does not liberalize or become a democracy. 
And of course, the third idea of the liberal global order is humiliated in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Iraq and Afghanistan are probably more important than I really wanted to acknowledge at the time. I sensed at the time I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I saw firsthand how mad these interventions were. I mean, it, it's very, very difficult to recover now how peculiar the way in which the foreign policy elite in Britain and the United States thought about those countries, the kind of things we said about those countries, even quite recently. Uh, 2002, having just walked across Afghanistan and been in villages in which perhaps one person in the community could read or write, in which there was no electricity between Herat and Kabul, in which the major commodity crop was uh, opium for heroin production, in which walking between two villages three hours apart uh, was almost impossible for the villagers themselves because they'd been in vendettas lasting 20, 25 years. I turn up in Kabul and hear President Karzai, Ashraf Ghani, senior US officials, and for some reason, Bianca Jagger, uh, sit on a panel like this and say, there is a commitment in Afghan society. Every Afghan is committed to, I quote, a gender sensitive, multi-ethnic centralized state based on democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Right? Now, this, this idea, right, which is now obviously grotesque, was peculiarly not obviously grotesque to a whole generation of very blight policymakers who proceeded to spend $3.5 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, achieving worse than nothing. I mean, in the case of Afghanistan, quite literally, we went in, got rid of a Taliban government, spent a trillion dollars, left again and handed it back to the Taliban. During the same period, China spent $3.5 trillion on the Belt and Road Initiative, bridges, roads, dams, infrastructure across Asia, Africa, Latin America, with considerably greater return to China than we derive from any of these things. This is also a period in which our own sense of our own legitimacy begins to be challenged through different forms of social movement that begin to point out that we're not quite as perfect as home as perhaps we had pretended that we might have been. And this is the period, of course, when social media begins to take off and Twitter and Facebook begins to take this bell jar that I'm talking about and make it become like the kind of souffle I cook at home, becomes a kind of U-shape <laughs> where the votes are now at my elbows and there are no longer any votes where my fingers are. This is the period that I enter parliament and this is the, the point of this book. I come into parliament in 2010 and I see this playing through in a whole series of ways. I see it playing through in austerity, which is David Cameron's attempt to try to hold to the neoliberal economic orthodoxies of the 90s. I see it uh, in the interventions in Libya and later the fluffed intervention in Syria, which attempt to replay some of the assumptions about democracy and liberal global orders from the previous era and begin to go horribly wrong. And of course, in 2014, about the middle of my time in politics, we then enter this third age. And it's this moment in 2014 where we suddenly find Narendra Modi is elected in India, ISIS takes Mosul, the following year, the Law and Justice Party are elected in Poland. 2016, uh, we find ourselves going into a Brexit referendum. 2018, Bolsonaro is elected in Brazil. And of course, in the middle of this period, Donald Trump is elected in the United States. And all the problems that remained unaddressed through the 90s and 2000s, economic, political, crisis of legitimacy, crisis of liberal global order, the emergence of new forms of social media create the conditions for populism, create the opportunities for the populists to polarize, to produce their own very, very peculiar narratives largely because what they had identified, that the problems they were identifying were often real. The solutions, of course, which they were proposing were gym crack, fake, flimsy, divisive, profoundly anti-democratic, anti-constitutional. So to finish, um, 
I'm, I hope as we go through this this encounter, we can talk a little bit about what's next and what that means for somebody like me who tried to represent a vision of the progressive center. Is there any hope for its return? What I certainly don't think we can be is a kind of tribute brand for Bill Clinton. Right? I don't think that is the way in which to deal with the threat of Donald Trump. Um, what I do think we need to do is to acknowledge our shame at what went wrong in the 90s and 2000s, but then produce a vision that is exciting, that has emotional content, that above all has an ethical content and has a serious, thoughtful, logical route, right. policies, policies which can be communicated with charm and charisma, but real policies which address the problems of our age. Um, so that's the kind of historical framing. And then when you look at the book, you'll find the book's not like that at all. <laughs> the book is a sort of tragedy comedy of trying to take you into the depths of the institution of politics. You feel what it's like to deal with your constituents, your whips, your ministers, your leader, understand what it actually means to say that a politician is voting on legislation or scrutinizing legislation or raising money from the donor or listening to their constituents. What is this idea of representation? I mean, maybe the thing that I'm most excited about of all is I think the entire idea of representation in the modern world should be questioned and contested. I represent a constituency in Northwest England, Cumbria. I speak for 100,000 people. By the time I'm in the cabinet, I'm speaking for 70 million people. But what does it really mean to represent someone, to speak for them? What do I know about them? What possible insight do I have into their very different identities and lives? How can I presume to speak on their behalf. And yet that is the nature of our entire democratic system. Okay, on that, I'm gonna stop talking and hand over to, to my two distinguished colleagues. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start off by asking um, why you joined the Conservative Party? Because I think based on what you just said and also various things in your beliefs and your background, it's not that obvious um, in certain ways. Uh, and also, I wanted to know how you define conservatism. Very good. Okay, very good. I'm going to stand up again <laughs> just for the benefit of people at the back. Um, so uh, I come from a tradition of conservatism, which is quite difficult uh, to communicate, particularly difficult to communicate to a, a presumably a progressive audience. Um, my version of conservatism is deeply rooted in a love of history, a love of tradition, a love of landscape, um, a deep attachment to constitution, in the case of, because I'm British to, do, do come on in if, you, if you'd like to, because um, I'm British to, uh, I guess, to the, the monarchy, uh, to the British army, I mean, all these things uh, make me weep when I, when I, <laughs> when I watch movies, right? Um, and, uh, it's very difficult to unpack what that means as a political platform. Um, the, the secret, of course, is in the conserving bit. Right? I'm, I'm about, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Slowly, slowly, respect the past, not too much rapid change. And I suppose if I had to put it on a bumper sticker, I would say it was respect for tradition, love of country, uh, prudence at home, restraint abroad. The, the paradox, of course, is that the right has no truck for any of that anymore. Uh, the, the right has become, in almost all our countries, a sort of pseudo-revolutionary force. I mean, it's not conservative at all. I mean, if you see the right in Israel at the moment, it's basically, or you see Boris Johnson in action, or you see Trump in action, the kind of things that make me teary-eyed, sort of defending the Constitution of absolutely no interest to the right anymore. It actually puts the left in a very awkward position. The left suddenly has to become the defenders of tradition, the defenders of the status quo, the defenders of the Constitution against uh, these right-wing forces, uh, which is a very unnatural position for the left to find itself forced into. Um, 
but yes, I'm a, I'm a I'm a liberal conservative. I'm or or, or what Mrs. Thatcher would politely call a wet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, talking about kind of adjusting to a new age as the world is changing. Um, there are points in the book where I think you almost do sound like a leftist. Um, you say, kind of describing the 2008 financial crisis, the markets so long praised for their sensitive, knowledgeable allocation of resources had not only been able to prevent the crash, they had caused it. The economic system designed by Thatcher and maintained under Blair had been humiliated. But in the rest of the book, when it came to your approach to the economy, I kind of felt like you were still with Thatcher. You know, it's like um, there's balanced budgets, limited government, some lip service to public services, but, you know, there's no unions in sight or anything like that. Um, so what is your kind of economic vision yeah. for the UK? Gosh, OK. So I think my basic vision is... Uh, taking power away from the center. Um, I think that many of the things that I want to say about economics uh, or about politics or about international relations are about removing power from the center. My basic belief is that our institutions in all our countries are far too centralized and that you're putting a completely absurd, surreal expectation on a few people sitting in Congress or Senate or the White House to be able to manage things they manifestly lack the knowledge, power or legitimacy to manage. Uh, and that the solution to this has to be to accept that we live in a very different society, that these political systems were designed, yeah, mostly they're 18th century products. They're 18th century products which imagined educated gentlemen amateurs acting as philosopher kings, ruling over much simpler societies where the government was responsible for a much tinier fraction of the national economy and was involved in far fewer pieces of people's lives. But we have kept that system going in countries where almost half of our economy is spent by the government, where the government is now responsible uh, certainly in Europe, but even in the United States, for so many intimate bits of your survival and existence. So in terms of economic policy, I want to avoid both the left and the right. I, I think the problem with both of them is they're too centralized. I think the right has some crazy idea that by cutting taxes and deregulating uh, from the center, they're going to be able to spark some sort of automatic miraculous growth, which was what Liz Truss and her extremely undistinguished 49 days and the British <laughs> Prime Minister try to do. But the left believes that it can, uh, essentially has a nostalgia for the 1970s. It believes that it can return to 1970s industrial policy, trade policy, protectionism, and fundamentally at some level, that there are some brilliant central planners and some fantastically well-informed economists who sitting at the center with big enough brains can somehow work out how to manage a society. My view is that, yes, we need industrial strategies, but not those type of industrial strategies. The industrial strategies need to be generated at a far more local level. And if I extend it to the final bit, which is international relations, this is the, my most pure vision, right? Uh, and maybe my best way of explaining the route back. I feel that where we went wrong in international development and I got this wrong. A lot of the book is about my getting this wrong as the Secretary of State for International Development in the British government. Is we realized, of course, that our international development projects were terrible. I mean, really terrible, that we were spending $200 billion a year and the impact was very, very bad. Right? We've gone from 170 million people in extreme poverty in Africa in 1980 to 470 million people in extreme poverty in Africa today. We have 700 million people in the world living on to under $2.15 a day, and we're spending $200 billion a year. And we're not actually achieving anything, really. Now, this is, it's not quite true, we're achieving some things in global health, but you know we're achieving a tiny percentage of what we could be achieving. I thought the problem was that we were not close enough to the ground. So I thought maybe what I need to do is send out development workers to get into villages. And what they need to do is study local languages better, consult better, 
you know, Samantha Power is doing some of this, give more money to local organizations, do more needs assessments, more consultations, and somehow the whole thing will be sorted out. My breakthrough is to realize that even this is misconceived, that actually what we should have been doing is giving unconditional cash transfers to individuals and getting completely out of the way. That the problem of me from the global north supporting someone in a Rwanda Burundi village is not solved by simply giving that power to someone from Kigali, from the capital city, or giving it to a local NGO. The problem is actually resolved by acknowledging that the individuals know more, care more, can do more, that their needs are much more diverse and disparate than anyone can anticipate, that the best way of really transforming that rural economy is not some smart person wasting an incredible amount of money asking them what they want and then writing a strategy to give them what they need, but is instead to get out of the way and actually give them the money to fix their own affairs. Now, that doesn't solve everything, right? There are still things that need to be done with public goods, but it would make a huge difference. And that's why I'm also uh, very, very uh, excited by the idea of far more cash for poverty in the United States as well. I'm going to ask two more and then hand it over to Susan. This one's going to be a fun one. Um, uh, so you talked about the book being a kind of tragic comedy. And also in the prologue, you kind of talk about various of your former colleagues that you might upset. <laughs> I was curious uh, who you think is going to be most upset by this book and what the, which are the kind of spiciest revelations? <laughs> um, well, so the, the, the book, you know, I, I had this is inside baseball for people who don't follow British politics, but I worked as a minister for Liz Truss, Priti Patel, and Boris Johnson, who are two, I mean, to have these people as three bosses is um, is 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 real material. Um, so to, to give you a sort of insight into these three people, Liz Truss, for example, I turn up to work and um, she, she uh, I'm the minister responsible for the environment and the national parks and flooding and water and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so she says to me on day one, Rory, I want you to write a 10 point plan for the national parks. So I say, absolutely terrific Secretary of State, you know, I'll get the chief executives all national parks together. We'll spend the next few weeks sitting down, get someone back in your desk and in the next three, four weeks. She says, no, I want something in three days. And I said, well, it's Secretary of State. And she says, I can write it for you now, get young people into the national parks, get people from the cities into the national parks. And I discover essentially that what is supposed to be policy is simply a press release. I then go back to see her and she says to me, Rory, I've had a new idea. I want you to cut the budgets of the national parks by 20%. And I said, Secretary of State, then this is devastating. I mean, they've got very little money. If we cut the national parks budget by 20%, I have a terrible impact. Probably. She says, all right, Rory, for you, 5%. So I say, Secretary, you're just cutting it by 5%. I mean, you know, there's really no point cutting at all. So she says, all right for you, Rory, don't cut it at all. And then she kind of pirouettes out. No. Um, but you realize why she was such a catastrophic prime minister, right? Let, let me give you, an, give you an example of Boris Johnson. So Boris Johnson was the foreign secretary. He sits in a room which is twice the size of this. You know, it's it's the room where all these sort of grand Victorian figures presided over, you know, whatever monstrosities were involved in the 19th century. He's sitting in that room, right? And he sits around the desk and he calls me in and I'm his deputy and he says, Rory, Libya. Libya is a bite-sized British problem. I want you to sort out Libya. So I say, well, Foreign Secretary, you know, we, we don't have an ambassador resident in Libya. We don't have a budget. I mean, I think if you gave us 40 million pounds, maybe we could do something for the Italians. We could do something with the UN. I'll try to get you something together. And he immediately loses all interest. Because the so-called optimism of these populists, the sort of sort out Libya, is actually pessimism. It's deeply cynical. They have no interest whatsoever in the steps that need to be taken to actually sort anything out. As soon as you talk about any detail, any problem, any challenge, they abandon the entire scheme. Because the entire thing is, is, is froth. I mean, it's, it's government by froth. Um, so those two won't like me. Um, it turns out many others are pretty cross too. I, I, 
I, it, it's a very, uh, amongst my many bits of foolishness, I read a whole book attacking all my colleagues, and then I'm mildly surprised to discover that <laughs> the whole British media is now going demented and accusing me of being a narcissistic, incompetent, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. Um, just, but yeah, I mean, just, I'm, I'm a Labour voter, but like, you know, I was sort of rooting for you at the moment when you're like, pounding Boris Johnson for the leadership, because he's like, the one guy who can stop Boris Johnson. Um, but anyway, uh, just before the 2017 election, you're disillusioned with your colleagues, um, and you give a very scathing description of the parliamentary culture um, among others, you criticize your fellow Etonians who often traded off old fashioned manners while shedding much of the honor or duty which once half justified some of our class. Um, so I was curious, Rory, what is the point of your class? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very, a very difficult personal thing that I'm, I, 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 I need to spend a lot of expensive money on therapy to work my way through. Um, <laughs> The basic idea of my class um, when I left my high school, when I left Eton, was a speech by the provost of Eton who said to us, you're all very privileged and therefore you have these responsibilities and you have to go out and you know, serve the public in return for your privilege. Um, and I realize now that this has basically been the alibi uh, for class inequality since about the time of the Roman Empire, right? <laughs> this is what the upper classes always do. They go around saying, oh, it's all very well. I've got all this money. And knights in shining armor did this. But, you know, I go out and fight. I go out and serve in government. So I, I get to live in a castle, basically, seems to be the um, seems to be the, the run on it. Um, the, the problem, though, says he, having criticized this notion, we still need a notion of virtue and honor in politics. And we need to generate that, that our constitutional structures, our law is not enough. We need people who like Cicero say that I exist not just for myself, but for my country. We cannot operate in a purely Machiavellian framework in which anything is justified, provided it results in power. We need to generate politicians who have the capacity to say no, and of course, have the capacity to do things which may ultimately destroy their own careers. And the question is, how does one generate a sense of Republican virtue, right? So the transition that's required in societies is of course, and you're going through this in the United States, I presume, although I'm not an expert on the history of the United States, I guess a whole WASP class of the 19th century and early 20th century also felt that they were living out some notion of noblesse oblige, served as diplomats, served as senators, served in the military, and had some prickly, peculiar notions of honor that drove what they did, as well as being all the other things that we know people to be corrupt, dishonest, hypocritical, <laughs> and all the other things. Right? There are a lot of scoundrels out there. Um, but the problem, it seems to me, in our contemporary societies is that it's very, very difficult to find any way of talking honestly about virtue. Um, and of course, there are good reasons for that. I mean, definitely talking about virtue, talking about honor, makes you seem like a, a, a massive hypocrite, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not the place of a politician to deliver moral lectures. Nevertheless, uh, unless we have some sense of dignity, some sense of equality, some sense of what the purpose of democracy is, some sense of our function, which is not to win, but to persuade, not to divide, but to try to unite. Some sense that what we say today and what we say tomorrow, what we say today and what we do tomorrow are somehow connected, some sense of integrity, uh, it's very difficult to imagine uh, a functioning politics. Ah, okay. Um, so I guess I want to bring us into the book a little bit more because um, I think it's very interesting, the relationship of the commons in particular to writing, because 
There are a lot of writers in the House of Commons, I think more than in the House of Representatives, it doesn't seem to me like representative uh, American politicians scribble away quite at the rate of British politicians. And <laughs> partly they, American, uh, British politicians write a lot of biographies. They write biographies of people they admire. So William Hague writes about mm -hmm. Wilberforce because he'd like to be Wilberforce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, oh, just, you know, um, you she, know, Michael Foote writes about Nye Bevan yeah, and, sure. you know, it's on and on and on. Yeah. So you've not done that. You've written a memoir. There's lots of memoirs by British politicians, <laughs> too. Everyone seems to write a memoir, but most people write a memoir at the end of the game and you've come in in the middle of the game. That strikes me as rather a risky thing to do. I'm surprised <laughs> that you said you're surprised that everybody's mad at you <laughs> because um, I mean, just to kind of give you, your book a plug here, this is really quite a good read. Partly it's a good read because it's pretty splenetic, right? You have a few people you like. You like Kenneth Clark and you like Theresa May and you like David Gauck. And I think you like these people because they do fit your definition of a politician with honor, right? And but you've got some pretty amazing little pen portraits and they're not just of people quite as loathsome as Liz Truss and Boris Johnson. <laughs> they're also people like Cameron. And I found the description of Cameron very interesting and I'm going to point, point to it here. David Cameron appears in the book with an easy smile, pink full cheeks, narrow eyes, and blurred features. Everyone has features, and I don't know how <laughs> you blur them except by, you know, squinting or looking through. So you are perceptive about his failing, his tendency to claim expertise on the bare basis of a trip or two. Uh, you say he's uh, kind of mostly he just is not perceptive. He doesn't recognize a politics is developing that is different from the kind of politics he wants. Boris Johnson will see that politics and lean into it. So much more cleverly, much more evilly. Um, <laughs> but I wondered if you want to reflect a little bit about yourself as a writer. What did you think when you were writing the book? I mean... Politics is a blood sport, kind of, and people do forgive a lot. And you probably do, do, aren't really a conservative, by the way. I mean, we've already been into that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I felt when I was reading it, I mean, those of us who grew up on Disney movies grew up on Thumper's mother telling Thumper, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> right? So, and... That clearly didn't happen. So it's a, I mean, that partly makes it really a great read. So that's a compliment, but I really wanted to know yeah. how conscious you were of the, it's a quite angry book. And I think you're right to be angry, but it's an yeah. angry book. Well, so it, it, you, I mean, I, I um, a, a very good friend of mine who's a, uh, 85 year old classics don at oxford read a draft of this and was really horrified he said you can't do this you can't talk about your colleagues in this way you can't talk about your institution in this way this would be like my writing about my oxford college in this way it's not done right and churchill says watching asquith give a speech uh, in 1906 he writes in a letter to, to a, a friend of his that Asquith at the dispatch box is so drunk, he, he can't speak. The prime minister is so drunk, he's kind of staggering around at the dispatch box. And Churchill says, it's it's only the omerta, the mafia code of silence that we have in mm -hmm. parliament that prevents this from getting out. So there are many, many reasons why politicians don't do this. Uh, they don't do this because they have future ambitions, and they want these people to vote for them. They don't do this because they want to vindicate to themselves that their profession is an exciting, glamorous profession full of wonderful people, right? Um, and 
Yeah, it's, if you're trying to project, if you're an intelligence officer trying to project yourself as James Bond, right? You you don't want to describe your colleagues as though they're out of Austin Powers, right? <laughs> you, you you have to keep up the idea that you're all these sort of glamorous, impressive people. But and then then I think for some of them, they're just nice, kind people who don't like being mean about other people. They don't, don't want to say nasty things about them. My view, though, is that we have an absolute obligation in a democracy to let the public see what is actually going on. And therefore, I have to try to be as honest as I can. Now, as a writer, my uh, hero uh, here that I'm dealing with in this book are, are two. On the one hand, Tacitus, the Roman historian, <laughs> uh, who really goes for it with his contemporary senators. Um, and on the other hand, V.S. Naipaul. Uh, and I still regret the fact that I'm not able to write with the clarity or brutality with which Naipaul writes. I think it's there's something so <coughs> impressive about his ability to detach and wound. And I think the my my actual anxiety in the book is that I may have pulled my punches too much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask you one other question, which is about policy and politics. One of the pleasures of reading the book is that you get inside these different ministries and you were shuffled, it seems, constantly. I mean, you you go through four ministries and five jobs, right? So you're, you know, it's amazing you could get anything done at all. And you, you seem to be very focused on getting some things done and you do do some things and it's exciting to watch the possibility of that happening and they're good things right like nobody thinks prison yards should be full of trash and you know I mean it's kind of basic stuff right and you're able to get them done and so that's actually quite gratifying um, but it also made me think because you pause periodically and you say yes I was able to do these few things or broadband say up in the borders yep. you know those kinds of things and but I could do so much more in Kabul. Uh, and I did more, in, you, you say, I did more in Kabul in nine months than I did in years as a minister. And that might be true, but you must have been also, but that's also a kind of, I mean, that's either a statement of how broken the political system is, or it's a statement of what an impediment having democracy is, mm -hmm. right? And because, of course, one can do more as the head of a charity or the governor of a district or yep. any of those kinds of things, because you don't have all these terrible people, yep. voters and yep. colleagues and that, those <laughs> sorts of things. And hmm. so I felt kind of like I was left thinking you have a very sharp sense of policy, but politics is also about party and persuasion and yep making people come along with you. And I didn't know if what you meant to say is that the political moment was so bad and your colleagues so populist and feckless that it was just impossible to work also as a politician, right? Yeah. And so that's the question because it's both. Polit successful politicians do both. They yeah. do policy and politics. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, so I... Um, so I think the first thing that I learned, and, and the book is partly about this discovery, is that I'd been a civil servant, and I thought being a politician was just like being a senior civil servant. Um, so, you know, I'd been a diplomat, and now I was the foreign minister, so I thought, you know, I'm just, and it's a lot of these people were my colleagues. My first meeting in the Department for International Development, five out of the seven people around the table were people that I'd known for 10 or 20 years. I'd worked with them in Iraq, I'd worked with them in Afghanistan, I'd worked with them in Indonesia. Right? And so I thought I can just run this like you could run a civil service department or a company. You know, we'll get around a table, we will discuss the issue of the day. Uh, I'll listen to everybody, I'll take their advice, I'll make a decision, and then we'll go and do it. Not at all. Like politicians cannot run departments like that because the civil service will not allow them to run departments. I mean, fundamentally, there is a deep, deep mistrust between professional civil servants and political appointees. Profound distrust. And the civil servants basically think that the political appointees are there 
for two years or four years, and then they'll move on, and that they have or six months, right? And that therefore, they have a very, very good reason not to want to respond immediately to what this person says, because this person may well not know anything about the subject, and certainly from civil servant's point of view, this Johnny come lately, who's turned up in their department, doesn't know half as much as they do. They've been working there for 20 years. That they're probably ideological and driven by crazy ideological beliefs, and likely they're not going to be there for very long anyway. So to actually achieve change in a democratic system, I discovered required much more dramatic kind of wrenches on the handbrake. It wasn't sort of small little iterations. The small iterations were completely sort of bizarre. I mean, I, I've, I've cut most of them out of the book. Um, my long-suffering editor here saw a, a draft here, which was twice the length. Right? Uh, and uh, and in that, you know, for example, I will share one story that is not in the book, so that you you have a bonus episode. <laughs> the director's cut. Um, I just just sort of straight to the issue, right? I I turn up in uh, Diffid, and civil servant comes and is talking to me about what we're doing in Yemen, and the British government is spending a hundred and fifty million pounds a year in Yemen. And I've been to Yemen, and I'm aware that we closed our embassy in Yemen four years before this conversation, and there's no British official in Yemen. So how are we spending £150 million a year? Well, Minister, we're we're giving it to local NGOs. And how do you know what they're doing with it? Well, Minister, we Skype with them. So I say, I'd like to see one of these Skype conversations with the Yemeni, please. And the civil servants sort of look at me like this, and I say, um, look, you know, don't worry, just a two-minute conversation will be fine. And they say, okay. um, And I say, take three weeks, take four weeks, because there's obviously some problem. Four weeks later, they turn up, and they say, more senior people, big directors from the department, minister, can you please tell me why were you so keen on seeing this Skype conversation with a Yemeni? And I have to say, look, I could give you a very pompous answer. I could say if you're spending £150 million a year, it's quite a good idea to have a conversation with someone from time to time. But there's a more fundamental thing. I asked you to do it. I don't care. You know, wrap a tea towel around your head, sit in the <laughs> local Starbucks, pretend to be a Yemeni. Give me something. I don't care, right? Um, what I realized that she as a minister is that I had to use slogans and go to the public to take power over my own department. I achieved change in prisons by saying not spending the first five months saying prisons are filthy prisons are violent prisons are drug run, but by saying on the bbc i will resign in 12 months unless violence is reduced in prison and suddenly then i took power of the department again in in the department the, uh, of international development i go to the media and i say i'm going to double the amount that this department spends on climate and the environment having spent a long time fighting civil servants who wouldn't do that, as soon as I've made that public commitment, the entire thing shifts and the department has to then set off in another direction. But it's now, is this a problem with me? Is this a problem with democracy? Or is it a problem with the British version of democracy? Um, I think the, the most important thing to understand is that a politician is a very curious beast. A politician is not like a chief executive. You know, Joe Biden, and that's maybe where President Obama got it wrong. I mean, President Obama, you know, is a much, much, obviously, uh, much more uh, interesting, intelligent, significant figure than I am. But I think I can resonate with him a little bit when I read what he's doing. I saw when the um, when he first took office, there were problems in Detroit and the car factories, and he decided to spend nine hours you know, researching and reading about, you know, automobile policy in Michigan. And then trying to hold seminars where he would try to debate with the heads of the different automobile companies on the basis of his nine hours of study. This is not politics. Right? In some ways, Joe Biden is a more successful politician because he understands that's not actually the business. That's not the nature of political leadership. It's much more the glad handing, the big speech, the grand idea, and it's much less about trying to prove that you're cleverer than your senior civil servants or that you've learned more. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So we're going to, I want to ask two questions as well, and then we're going to open it up. The, the first question, 
has to do, you know, you write within a certain British tradition as well. There is a British tradition of expressing a sort of anger about government from within or about policy from within. Easiest versions uh, would be yes, prime minister, yes, minister. And then also, <laughs> there's a sort of, you know, the, you are a little bit in your own book like a John le Carre character who kind of figures out that, you know, the, the secret service all around is, is, is a complete mess not to mention not working for what they're supposed to be, but in fact, for other versions of it. And there's a way in which I read you in this, and these are intended to create a measure of anger and a measure of, of entertainment. But both in the beginning here and in your most successful speech um, while running for the leadership, you speak of shame. And I was very curious what shame is to you in this context. You give us a clear sense of failure to reach certain ideals, both politically, but but I'd like to understand a little bit what that feeling is uh, for you as a So I, I think um, I, I had an American friend who, who was in the audience at that speech who said to me, you, you can't talk about shame. It's not something that you should be talking about in politics. And I, I still haven't fully understood whether shame means something different in, in the US context. For me, a shame fundamentally means I cannot bring someone from another place to my country and show them this. Um, it means I cannot imagine putting my mother in this hospital. I cannot imagine being locked up in this prison, that this is so disgustful, disgusting, so violent, so incompetent, so poorly done, so poorly executed. So, hey, it, yeah. I, I, Um, the, the analogy with Le Carre is interesting. I'm, I'm deeply inf influenced by Le Carre. Uh, uh, so I, I'm pleased that you noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and with that, then, something about, the, let's say, toward the climax of the book that appears earlier as well. There's a way in which, during the contest for the leadership, you have, it becomes a sort of litany of not quite betrayals, not in the sense that people owed you, but sort of they did. And there's a way in which I have been reading the book until then as a kind of series of, of a kind of systems theory thing. There's all these systems, there's a civil service, there's British politics, there's you know foreign office and so on and so forth. And now suddenly, not only have they been clashing all this time dysfunctionally, and then you can appeal to the, the outside public and so on, but now suddenly they begin to get warped. And there's something about this warping by populism. And I ended up, I asked about shame in part because I'm very curious about political emotions, but I'm very curious about what you present here in a narrative fashion about what populism does. And you don't quite answer what it does to people. You you answer what it does to their judgment and their effect on, on others and to a sense of, you know, you spoke of virtue and, and in yeah. some respects, decency and serious hmm. engagement. I was very curious what your sense was about if we had to have a little theory of populism, um, you know, Take no more than three minutes down for that. Uh, I feel like you had to have a little bit yeah. of a theory of populism. How do you think of that? Is it an emotional thing? Is it a warping thing? Is it a is it a, a sort of leadership scenario, or is it a kind of, you know, anything goes? It, did you think of it as kind of Machiavellian? Anything goes just to get power. Yeah, I I, I think it is Machiavellian. Anything goes to get power, and I think um, from a policy point of view, I think the fundamental issue. And this is not just true of the sort of full Trumpian populism. It's actually true of the kind of politics that preceded it. Essentially, politics becomes so much about winning, so much about campaigning, so much about sticking it to the opposition. Uh, and in order to campaign in the contemporary media environment, it is about very black and white statements, extreme simplicity, uh, total confidence. And these things are at odds with critical thinking. So critical thinking, the kind of skills you need to govern when you're sitting around the cabinet table, are the reverse of that. Right? Instead of extreme confidence, you need humility. Instead of simplicity, you need complexity. You need to be able to learn from other countries. You need to be able to admit that you're wrong. You need to be able to listen to other people. And the mask that you put on, this is where Machiavelli, I think, is wrong. 
Machiavelli thinks that you can put on the mask to take power and then take it off once you have achieved power and govern well. I don't think you can. I think the mask which you require to campaign and take power is, is coated with a poison on the inside and it corrodes you. It corrodes your mind, your body, your soul. So it manifests itself in poor government. It manifests itself in Boris Johnson's very inept, inconstant, inconsistent attempts to respond to COVID. You know, didn't want to lock down, too slow to lock down, then locks down for too long, too slow to lift the restrictions, and meanwhile is partying at Downing Street while he's locking everybody else down, right? Now, this, so there's that problem, but I think maybe the more interesting problem is what it actually does to the individual's character. And I think what it does to the individual's character, the betrayals were very, very interesting to me because they were people who, there was a man called Robert Buckland, for example, who was the attorney general. And Robert Buckland presented himself as this very sort of old fashioned gentleman. You know, he wore three piece suits and he sung Gilbert and Sullivan opera. And his favorite uh, film was A Man for All Seasons. And he mm -hmm. could recite this film. And he was very taken with the fact that uh, one of my ancestors is a guy called Richard Lord Rich, who appears in this movie. And and Thomas More, who is the absolute sort of definition of integrity, you know, the anti-Machiavellian figure, um, says to Rich, who sold him out, you know, you know, what profit is the man uh, to, to get uh, to lose his soul and get the world? And, but he's done it for Wales, he says, but for Wales, Richard, for Wales, right, to be Attorney General of Wales. Now, Robert Buckland, who set himself up in this way and was one of the most prominent Remainers, suddenly has to put himself, feels he has to put himself behind Boris Johnson in order to become the Welsh Secretary. <laughs> uh, uh, and eventually Lord Chancellor to take Thomas More's position. Um, or my principal private secretary, who again was somebody I was very fond of and was incredibly idealistic, again, puts out a video looking like he's been taken hostage, in which he says, Boris Johnson will be a leader of immense integrity, you know, he's going to lead our country on to great things. And, and I think one underestimates the, the psychic damage. I mean, I saw one of these guys who was serving in Boris Johnson's cabinet nine months later, and he looked terrible. I mean, he'd aged a lot. And I said, what is it like? And he said, I, I cannot tell you how awful it is, you know, how awful it is living this life. So there is there is a sense that, I mean, you know, we're, we're not in the business of being sympathetic to politicians, but, <laughs> but, but, but what was so sad about these betrayals is that often all I was asking for them to do was to stand against Boris Johnson. All of them knew he was a terrible human being. All of them knew he would be a terrible prime minister. All they had to do was not vote for him. It wasn't a very difficult thing to ask. Um, and yet they felt they had to. They had to for their careers. They they, they had to for their relationships. I, I remember a, a woman who I still really like, sort of in tears saying, Rory, you know, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but, you know, I, I have to go with him. Um, and I think that's, I don't know what's going on in the heads of Republican senators and Congress people at the moment. Um, yeah. But I imagine they are more miserable than we acknowledge. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, what do you think? Please uh, introduce yourselves just by name uh, so we can have you as we're recording anything, uh, everything anyway. Uh, and second, please signal me and I will keep a list as we go. Um, I'm Teresa Bejan. I actually am an Oxford Don, so I'm just visiting. Um, but I wanted to ask about the identity of conservatism. So for my sins over the past few years, I've been charged with giving the lecture on conservatism to PPEs because none of my colleagues want to for reasons we can talk about. But I'm just really curious about sort of what, what sorts of things do you think they should be reading? Are there texts that you've read that you think really in, have shaped your approach are they of a suitable length that I could assign them readily? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very difficult. I mean, I would, I mean, obviously they should be reading Burke and they should be reading Oakshot. They're not. They're reading Oakshot, they're not reading Burke. I think they should maybe be looking 
And this, you know, this is pushing it, but I think they should be looking at Hannah Arendt. I think they should be looking at Aristotle. Um, I think the, the conservatism for me is about being situated in place and context. I think the reason why Aristotle is such a helpful political philosopher is he's so specific to a particular time and place. He, he's defining what it means to be a, a person of man, in fact, in Athens for this particular Political philosophy emerges from that. And I think as a conservative, um, we emphasize the particular over the universal. We're suspicious of the notion of best practice. Suspicious the notion that some um, scheme used by a think tank ported into the notion. I think, um, but above all, they should be reading Yates. There's a, <laughs> there's a great line in the uh, Tower where uh, Yeats's narrator says, Burke, Barclay, Goldsmith all hated Wiggery, that leveling, rancorous, rational sort of mind that never looked out of the eye of a saint or out of a drunkard's eye. All's Wiggery now, and we old men are massed against the world. <laughs> and, uh, so the conservatives <laughs> speak the saint and the drunkard. <laughs> In the third line here, one, two. Yes, yourself and then two. Uh, my name is James Martin. Uh, my question's about where you began. You began. So you kind of didn't talk about the book at all. You were talking about these ages and then, I guess, a crisis in uh, representative democracy and a wish, I suppose, to shift from that to something else on the basis that it had outlived its purpose and that it was connected to a restricted franchise, and as the franchise extended, it did just all. And what I'm curious about, I suppose, is how that transition actually happens in practical terms. Partly because presumably the people who are in these various representative democracies are perfectly happy in many cases being there and are unlikely to just go away. And I suppose linked to that, what's a conservative transition? which is looking backwards and trying to conserve while simultaneously making quite a radical shift. I think, I think you've put your fingers on a lot of problems. <laughs> and one of them is obviously, um, you know, I, I said to you at the beginning of this talk that I'm somebody with a deep respect for the tradition of the Constitution. But I'm also somebody who thinks the Constitution is all wrecked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and that's so. I'm a, and, and that's been a painful journey for me. Um, but I think that I'm a great believer in citizens' assemblies. I'm very excited by citizens' assemblies, which for people who don't follow them are selected by sortition. They're like a jury. They're a random selection of 300 citizens who sit down for three days to address an issue. I think I can make a conservative case for that. Make a conservative case. wisdom of people. You can also make a liberal case for equality of citizens and their equal right to uh, deliberate. Um, you can also make a utilitarian case. I mean, the outcomes of citizens are wonderful. In Ireland, the abortion issue was a classic example. Terribly, terribly divided country. I mean, as divided as the US on abortion. And a citizens assembly composed of 300 people, roughly equally divided <laughs> over the course of a few days, uh, managed to find their way towards a consensus, move the conversation from pro-life, pro-choice to a number of days, uh, which they felt did, did an abortion. And changed the Irish constitution. And I've seen huge impressive results in the environment. I've seen huge impressive results on local planning. I think we could have made a lot of progress on Brexit. We had a citizens' assembly, I think it would have ended up as a soft Brexit, not a hard Brexit. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 that's one thing I'm very excited about. I don't think it's a total answer to you. I mean, I also want to now, how do I deal with the problem that Turkeys don't vote for Christmas? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Turkeys do sometimes end up being forced to vote for Christmas, or at least they end up on the Christmas platter. Um, <laughs> and there are new Turkeys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so New Zealand, for example, uh, radically changed its electoral system. Um, 
uh, against the interests of the MPs that were in. And they did it. It can be done. I think it's tough. You have to make an overwhelming public argument for it. One of the reasons I want to write books saying the system's broken is that I really have to get people to be steeped in the sense of just how bad the system is before I can really generate change. But um, no, I don't. I don't think change is impossible. But obviously, as a conservative, I hope it doesn't have to come with a bloody revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this at the beginning of that you thought last year. And you also didn't now on Yeah, so I mean, I think the inflection point in February last year is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think it's at that point which suggests that the age of populism begins to shift into a new age, which is increasingly defined by a conflict between the United States and its allies and the rest of the world. I mean, I think the, the, the problem that we are facing is that the assumptions of the 90s that the US and the UK and Europe have a lot of friends in the world is being tested hard. The votes on Ukraine are not as encouraging for the White House as the White House want to believe. Uh, the alliances the U.S. is trying to create against China, very, very fragile. So, yes, you can sign up Japan, you can sign up the Philippines, maybe, sign up Australia, maybe able to sign up Vietnam, up South Korea, that's about it. Singapore's not coming along. India's not playing ball. Uh, the BRICS are now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Purchasing power parity terms, their economies are now the same size as the G7. As the 1970s, the G7 was 70% of the global economy. And we have entered a world, I think, in which I, I think there's a, a 40, 50% likelihood of aggressive <laughs> Chinese action against Taiwan but quickly. Well, yes. Mm. We'll be feel encouraged towards that by actually the economic problems in China. I think we will find the consequences of the fact that Taiwan has 50% of the world's semiconductors, 90% of the world's advanced semiconductors, suddenly either removed from the world or in Chinese hands. It's going to change things. I think AI is changing things far more rapidly than possibly imagined. I think the next iteration of these large language models are going to be beyond imagining capabilities. That will have a huge impact on politics in the short term. I think you ain't seen nothing. 2016 is one thing. Your next election is going to be <clears throat> jiggered about by AI in ways that you can't begin to imagine. And not just in terms of deep fake, not just that it inevitably you know, the presidential debate will be faked out to make Biden appear even more fra frail and uh, sort of seen out than he may actually be. Um, it's actually that it will be generating political and cultural movements, and manipulating people in ways that we can't. So my, my sense is that we're, in a sense, 2014, in February last year, age of populism is one thing, but the age we're moving into is a much more dangerous age where the collapse of the liberal global order has coincided not as some people, liberals. I mean, I think the, the interesting thing is that Inclusion from the right and the left in 2014 onwards was basically isolationist. It doesn't matter whether you're Trump or whether you're Biden. Essentially, it's isolation. Essentially, the idea from the right is these countries are none of our business from the left. Oh, well, we cause all these problems. So maybe it's better if we just don't get involved. But since 2014, the number of democracies has begun to fall dramatically. Every year, the number of refugees has increased. The number of internally displaced people have increased. The number of civilians killed in conflict have increased. We are not in the Stephen Pinker universe of everything going cheerfully better. Um, so I, I, yeah, that's that's my sense of the age to come, and and I think then the story of the thirty five years that preceded it, and the banality, the shoddiness, the incapacity, the reality, the lack of seriousness of our politicians becomes that much more serious. 
um, in the past, in the back, and then all the way in the corner. No, so go ahead. Hi, Rory. It's Shanghai, and it's so good to see you. Um, you've talked in your last part of your remarks about what it means to be representative in democracy, and obviously, you've told us here in your book about the sense of shame and the personal toll that public life took on your dignity and sense of self worth. So I wanted to ask um, if you could reflect on a moment, even as small as helping a constituent or reducing violence in those 10 prisons, about a moment that you actually felt pride in what you did, and forced to go a time when those close around you felt proud of you. Yeah, can we take yeah, two at please, a time? Please, please, please. Uh, my name is Sergio. I am a, a master's student here at NYU, just studying international development. So I wanted to ask you about what you think the future of international development looks like. I understand that you believe cash transfers should become the norm, instead of the more traditional capacity building approach. Um, but I'd be curious to know if you think that will actually happen. I'd be curious to know if you still have trouble convincing people and politicians that cash transfers are the right choice. Right, let me try to take two in reverse order. So, so firstly, um, yes, I believe unconditional cash transfers is very much the way to go. I think it's been an extraordinary revolution. The evidence is now out there. Randomized control trials establish that cash is outperforming almost all traditional development programs, dollar for dollar. There are now more than 300 academic papers demonstrating it. Yes, it's counterintuitive, difficult to believe. Right, We've been told for decades that you give someone a fish they eat for a day, you teach them to fish they eat for a lifetime. But what we're discovering is that, in fact, the villagers already know how to fish. They just don't have the money to buy a fish. <laughs> they don't want to fish. They want to open a bakery. The great thing about unconditional cash is it allows them to do that. And that we are wasting phenomenal amounts of money um, trying to listen to people and then tell them what to do. Um, uh, but achieving that change is very difficult politically because the public is very, very nervous about cash. Politicians are very nervous about cash. So it's one of the classic problems. There is very strong evidence. I can show people villages on the Rwanda-Burundi border where for $70,000 given in $700 lump sums to 100 houses, the entire community has been transformed in three months. Electrification has doubled. <laughs> livestock ownership's doubled. 100% of people have latrines, 100% of people have government health insurance, and that it would cost two, $3 million through a conventional program to achieve that. And yet, uh, getting there is going to be very tough. Um, question on where I felt genuine pride. Um, I felt genuine pride in standing up against Boris Johnson. I found my feet. I found my sense of vocation doing it. And I came alive. My speeches were better, my communication was better, my interviews were better. I'd really found something I believed in. I believed that a no-deal Brexit was going to be deeply damaging to Britain, British economy. I believed this man was going to be a shameful, shameful man, and he was going to be deeply damaging to our country. So I was incredibly proud of being able to stand up against him. I felt great pride going into an interview with him where he tried to convince me to stay in the cabinet, and I could say to him, I have no intention of being in your cabinet. Um, but it, it was also very painful because, of course, he responded by throwing me out of the Conservative Party, I was ejected from Parliament, and I spent a long time coming to terms with my failure, my failure to prevent an ideal Brexit, my failure to prevent Johnson becoming Prime Minister. Um, so... Um, it's a difficult balance. I mean, you can feel at moments moral energy and pride. At other moments, you can feel real dismay as though your entire life's project, this thing that you held up as being so important, is something that you... Okay, so... Um, yes, I'm... Hello, Rory. Uh, my name's Fergus. Um, British expat, as you might be able to tell. Um, we're not talking about fiscal conservatism. Um, and in the podcast, you and I uh, um, often talk about um, the regret you feel about or the, the, the criticism you have of people like Cameron Osborne all the cuts they made, particularly to the prison service, um, and how damaging that has been in the long run. Um, but 
Fiscal conservatism obviously is also about making tough choices on spending and yeah, spending less than you're able to raise. So if you, you know, given that we came out of the pandemic with 400 billion in extra debt, you really had to make a cut somewhere. Where would it be? Which department? <laughs> It's a very good challenge, I mean, and it's an important challenge, not just for a Conservative government, but a Labour government coming in, because as Liz Trust discovered, you know, we're not the world's reserve currency. <laughs> right? We can't go around borrowing forever, money forever. Um, and that, that is a real constraint. I mean, she, she tried to, relatively modest, actually, you know, 45 million worth of borrowing, um, which would have put Britain still in terms of the amount that government spends as a percentage of GDP and it's borrowing well below Canada, the United States, et cetera. Of course, as you know, the markets panic and collapse. Gilts went off the edge, et cetera. Um, so I'd be interested in uh, getting rid of our nuclear deterrent. That could save quite a lot of money. Um, uh, I think that I would like to um, impose a wealth tax on houses. Take the value of their houses away from when they die in order to fund social care. And the fundamental problem in Britain is that our tax level now in Britain is higher than it's been any time since the Andy government cuts. Our borrowing is at its time. But our public services are creaky, able to actually run a decent health service. Um, and our demographics are going the wrong direction. Right? When all the when the welfare state was first put in place by Lloyd George that was one retired person for every 20 working people. Today, there are three working people for every retired person. There's soon going to be two working people <laughs> for every one retired person. Um, and the maths doesn't really work. Um, and I think the way this, the rubber really hits the road is in terms of environmental policy. We are going to we're in a very dangerous situation, which in order to achieve the energy transition, we are being very regressive. We're putting the costs on the poor. Fuel bills uh, represent a much higher proportion of their income. You are rich. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a very bad moment. These are difficult things to explain, and they're wonderful opportunities for all Yes, yourself. I'm sorry, I have, them. I have too many people in line. And then one, two, three. I'll and then take let's three see where we are. So, what else? So, That's great. Yeah. Right. Uh, Roy, my name is Dan Gerstein. Um, your journey really resonates with me. I worked in national politics here in the U.S. for more than a decade, and I left uh, feeling I needed to to preserve my soul, and that was in 2004. <laughs> um, so at the time you were entering, I was exiting. Um, you know, a lot of what you're saying in terms of the universal trend lines and the similarities between what's happened in the UK and the US um, ring true. I would say one significant difference is the subtext of race here and that the age of populism has progressed into an age of culture war um, and to some degree at the extremes race war. And you know, I have a lot of my friends who are like, how can these Republicans tolerate Trump? How can they, you know, not speak out? And a lot of it is the same as the Omerta that I saw in Washington in the Clinton Bush era. But there's a whole nother level of fear. And it's come out a little bit with this Mitt Romney confessional. He's paying $5,000 a day for extra security. You hear the explanations for some of the Republic, sensible Republicans voted against impeachment for January 6th. And they won't say this publicly, but they were scared for their lives. There were death threats, multiple death threats. So my question to you is, how do we get back to a place where we 
instill virtue or expect virtue from our leadership when they literally fear for their lives. Um, Eric, oh, sorry. Uh, Jay Garcia, this is somewhat related, actually, uh, because the, the discussion of shame reminded me that there was a British cultural critic, Paul Gilroy, who some years back made a case for a kind of productive shame. But there it was vis-a-vis -vis empire and the ongoingness of racism. And that was the topic. But I guess I wonder what you think about that generally. But also, relatedly, I uh, was curious if you were involved in discussions related to immigration policy in Windrush, because that, that actually came into the U.S., radar for a moment, at least in the Times, whereas these people who had been citizens for decades suddenly were not citizens. Obviously, the history of empire was shot through that. I'm wondering yeah. if you thought. Let me take a set as well. Yeah. Okay, um, um, uh, Eric Dixon, NYU Politics Department. Um, so we're seeing an exodus of people like Mitt Romney, who are, you know, wets, traditionally conservative politicians who are leaving politics. Um, I'm wondering what advice you would give to people who are considering running for office, <laughs> whether they're on the center right or on the center left. Uh, in terms of how they can uh, work to strengthen our institutions uh, and how they can promote rational and collaborative ways of trying to um, pursue the public interest? Should they just not do it? <laughs> um, or, you know, what would you tell them yeah. um, to kind of yeah. help them be ready yeah. um, for the challenges? Yeah, okay. I mean, I think these are three very different questions and, and difficult to weave together. Um, I think your point, though, about fear and the culture, so well taken. And it's very tempting. Obviously, my, my emphasis was largely explaining populism in terms of economic shifts, financial crisis, the problems of the old neoliberal economic system in which that generated this. There's a sense in which Jake Sullivan shares some of that analysis and thinks the answer and the way to win back Trump voters is to do better industrial policy in Rust Belt areas. Um, but you're right, and this may be related. Is, uh, that culture is a way in which, and this is where I think AI will become even more dangerous. I mean, I can really imagine AI being very, very good at micro manipulating these forms of cultural fractures and divisions and creating pseudo. I mean, I, you know, um, one way of thinking about the threat of AI is that it will be able to generate 200 far more powerful and effective QAnons very, very easily. Um, so that then raises the question, is it actually possible? To, and I you know, make this question, what happens if you try to give advice to a young person being a politician? I think you have to assert the value of politics as public service. And you have to maintain the idea that your role is to try to not divide, but, but empathize. But what we can't get dragged into is a universe of saying that Trump voters or Brexit voters are inherently ignorant, evil, racist people. We have to find a way of attacking the extreme immorality, the evil that people like Trump or Johnson represent, while also finding a way of relating to our fellow citizens and taking them seriously as people. Um, and Brian Garson at Yale, I think, writes very movingly about the idea of persuasion. Again, reaching back to Aristotle, the, the idea of rhetoric, political communication is supposed to be not simply that I am addressing you, but that I am resonating from you, that to be a good orator, I need to be able to understand you, I prejudices, your emotions, I need to be able to read your eyes, I need to be able to adjust my speech and sentences to tiny micro movements of your emotions. And I need to believe in the possibility of education. And I need to believe in the possibility, not just of my persuading you, but of your persuading me, right, that we are all equal citizens. I'm not a philosopher king. The great insight of the democracy is that you have an exact, equal, numerical right to what I possess through your vote, and that you each have an equal dignity as individual citizens. 
and that you know more, care more, can do more than I can about a whole series of issues. You have a forms of legitimacy, power, and knowledge that I lack, and that therefore politics is a partnership. Now, how you take these highfalutin ideas and take the unfortunate idealistic politician uh, bimmed up with virtue and belief in an Aristotelian thing and then throw them into the circus of American politics. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I still believe that we have no alternative. That in the end, politics has to rely on virtue. Right. Uh, one, two, and then I have an online question that I'll go ahead to. Quick question about the publication. But my name is an undergraduate politics student at College of Art and Science. I found myself in a bookstore the other day looking for politics on the edge, and I couldn't find it. What's the difference between the US and the UK market that triggered the name change? In the photo. Yeah. In the photo. In the photo. Yeah. So. The answer is that um, I, I will have to. We have the we have have my editor here who can question. I think the answer probably is that um, as somebody who is still a, a relatively active pseudo politician in the United Kingdom, um, I felt that how not to be a politician was a slightly overly comical debate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it. I'm both uh, being destructively mean about my profession. Matching, I might have political ambitions in the future. Um, so, <laughs> portraying myself as a, a Herdwick sheep under the title How Not to Be a Politician, I, I felt might work better with an international audience than <laughs> with my voters. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I have a question about the Was that right? Okay, so then I'll go ahead with the last question. It's a very easy, very short question. But let's try and see how short it can be. The questioner asks, we have yet to mention climate change. What are your views on how one addresses this when politicians rely on economic growth, which is eventually Very short. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the first thing to, to say is to uh, take a question like that and understand that one of the problems with politics is a problem of acting. Essentially, the politician's job is to fluently take a question like that and then produce neat three sentences to show that I have an absolute plan for addressing the situation. I understand the questioner and I've got a clear thing and you're going to vote for me. I've got the answer to this. The truth of the matter is that we don't know very much about very much. Right? We are expected to pretend to climate change and health and education and defense on Ukraine, on Singapore, uh, on social security. We are expected to understand every dimension of experience in our country. Um, we know very little of it. Um, so what have I got to say about climate change? Clearly, there is a massive problem in the notion of infinite growth and a planet with finite resources. It just doesn't stack up. And if we keep growing at 2% a year, although some would say Britain will be lucky to be growing at 2% a year, but if we were able to grow at 2% a year, pretty quickly that compounds into the most astonishing consumption of planetary resources. So logically, if we are actually to preserve our planetary boundaries, our climate, our environment, our natural resources, we need to find a way to transition away from growth. But at the same time, that is a political statement of so much more magnitude than anyone can begin to process. Our entire political systems are predicated on growth. Because of demographic change, health costs by themselves in our countries <laughs> increase by between 5 and 6% a year without inflation. That's just the increase in the cost of drugs, and that's an aging population and more demands. If we were to not only stop growth, but try to achieve an equitable situation in which countries in sub-Saharan Africa were at the same standard of living of the United Kingdom, you would be looking at a reduction in UK GDP of 70%. We currently spend 50% of our economy on public services. That would mean 
the most astonishingly radical reduction in the quality of the healthcare you would receive, the education you would receive, potholes being put in your roads, etc. And we have not yet found a way of incentivizing the carbon transition that does not involve taxing energy use. That involves, as I said before, putting the burden. So I'm going to finish with that because the, the, the job of the politician is to play act, to form, to produce slick answers. Uh, I think perhaps a better approach common citizens share problems and try to listen where the solutions might be.